Hello, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for our third Workplace Live of 2022. Can you believe it is already July? I have no idea where this year is going to. Um, I'm Abby Guthkelch and I'm joining you from the uh, Meta's office in, in London. I normally do this uh, from home, but I've decided to to come into the office and, and give this a whirl. And I'm part of our global B2B Reality Labs team here at Meta. Now, for those of you who are used to joining our other workplace social media lives, you will know that we are always joined by an incredible array of thought leaders in the culture, leadership, employee experience space. And this year, our live series is focused on driving conversation specifically around the future of work. And we've been gaining insights from our wonderful guest speakers on how leaders should be navigating through, redesigning and ultimately enabling their organisations to thrive in the rapidly changing world of work. Now, the topic of work, of the future of work even, is, is, not, is not a new one. Um, it's been a, a focus of, uh, an area of focus for consultancy firms, technology companies, um, and thought leaders for a number of years. But thanks largely to the overnight um, uh, force change that the COVID-19 pandemic brought to the global workplace, it has become a more mainstream topic, which every leader and organization is now focused on. Now, my guest today is somebody who has been thinking about this topic for a number of years. Jennifer McClure is an entrepreneur, keynote speaker and high performance coach who works with leaders to leverage their influence, increase their impact and accelerate results. Jennifer is frequently recognised as a global influencer and expert on the future of work, which bodes well for us in this, this conversation, uh, as well as strategic leadership and uh, innovative people strategies. Now, Jennifer, I, I, I always love this. I, I was saying this to you um, earlier in the week, you know, um, how you phrase this, has decades of in the trenches leadership and executive uh, experience. I think the in the trenches for any um, uh, listener out there who has either worked within an organization within our HR, comms, technology, will absolutely understand the in the trenches element to, to that. Um, working in uh, and with startups, privately held companies and Fortune 500 organizations in a variety of industries. Now, before I hand over to, to Jennifer, um, I do just want to remind everyone that is uh, is dialing in, who's watching us live, that I want to put as many questions to Jennifer as possible from the audience. We want to make this interactive, not just me coming up with the, uh, the questions. So please do type any questions that you have into the comments as you think of them. Um, and one of the team will get um, them over to me so I can try and get through as many as we can before we reach the half hour. But I also recognize that it's also not just live viewers that we have, a lot of people watch this back um, on demand. Please feel free to keep the conversation going. Keep asking those questions um, back into, uh, into the comments box. We have amazing community managers over here who will continue to, um, to have that conversation with you. So without further ado, welcome Jennifer. Thank you so much for agreeing to join me today. And firstly, please tell everyone where in the world are you joining us from today? I am excited to be here and joining you to talk about one of my favorite topics. And today I am in Cincinnati, Ohio in the US. Fantastic. Now, of course, I'm a Brit, so I always ask about the weather. How's the weather in Cincinnati today? It is, it is lovely today. We've been suffering with some heat like a lot of the world, but uh, today we've we've got a little reprieve. So I'm going to go out and enjoy it soon. Oh, fantastic. And uh, I have to say, I'm very much enjoying the air con um, from the office uh, today. Now, I'd love to start with a definition of, of the future of work. You know, it's a huge topic and, you know, it can mean different things to organizations, you know, different stages of where they're at in their journey, et cetera, and particularly in how they should be approaching it. Um, but I'm interested in, in understanding from you, what does the future of work mean to, to you specifically? 
The future of work to me is really fluid and ever changing. I don't know that I can put my finger on something and say, this is what it means to be in the future of work. I think for leaders, the future of work is today, tomorrow. It's ever changing. I know 12 years ago when I started my business as a professional speaker and trainer, I did talks on the future of work and I showed slides with studies about 2020 and the talent challenges that we were going to be having in 2020. And then Wow, 2020 happened and a lot of those things didn't come out, but we are experiencing those challenges today and the reality is talent challenges, people challenges are going to continue, but what has changed is the pace of change. We were looking out into the future before where today things could change from the way they were last week, they could change to next week, and so the future of work is ever changing and evolving. I couldn't agree with you more, and particularly that point you made about just the sheer acceleration um, of change um, over um, over the last few years, and you know, particularly within the the, the talent space or within the HR. Um, you know, I, I remember when I um, you know worked in in house as a as a communicator, and you know, when you wanted to get policy changes through, and you were told, "Well, no, that takes like years to basically you know happen," and yet you know, uh, uh, it unfortunately took a pandemic to, for businesses to realize that actually they could move at a, at a more agile um, pace. Now, you know, you mentioned there about, you know, sort of like constantly evolving um, environments. Uh, what current trends um, should, should people be really focusing or looking at um, uh, that you can kind of lean into at the moment? I think, you know, in terms of like a global trend related to people, it really is that the focus is on people today. While the population of the world may continue to grow, the population is not growing necessarily in the industrialized nations where the job growth is. So we have to get creative as leaders and think about how are we going to get the right people on board with the right skills that we need to do the work that's required and to meet our objectives now and in the future. And that's going to involve upskilling and reskilling some of the people that you already have and also understanding how to pre-skill people to bring them into your workplace in the future. So I think in terms of global trends, there's a real focus on skills development, as there should be, and skills development before you hire them, even if you're not the one that ultimately gets to hire them, but certainly skills development for the people in your organization to help them grow with the jobs of the future and the needs of your business today. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's conversations that we're 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 seeing, um, you know, across our customer base as well. Like really leaning into um, to to that upskilling, reskilling um, uh, side. Not not just you know, as you say, folk that you have in in the organisation, but you know, even thinking about it before before they come in. Just wondering, is there sort of any um, tangible uh, advice or tips that you can you can give around uh, um, reskilling initiatives that you've seen working? Sure. I think with a lot of the leaders that I'm talking with. The first step is the one that's often the one that is is missed. The first step is to understand the skills that you have available in your workplace today. Do you know what skills people have? Are they able to add skills? Or are you able to dissertate the skills that they have that they may develop in the future? The reality is in the past, you know, when I was in the trenches in human resources, you hired someone for a job title and the career path was pretty much in that. And that's the way we considered you with blinders. Like you're now in a track and that's the way you're going. We have to think completely different today. There may be someone sitting in human resources who has great marketing skills and abilities. There may be someone sitting in operations who creates video games on their phone uh, in their spare time. So they have some computer skills. We've got to understand what skills are available in our existing workforce and have a method and a way to show people what paths are available to them that they could pursue if they continue to develop those skills. I absolutely agree. Now we've started to get some audience questions coming in and Gihan, I will come to your question in a minute. I just want to fast follow on something that um, Jennifer said there and you were like talking about eight, um, human resources, HR or people to teams, you know, every company has its sort of like slightly um, uh, uh, named in, in a different way. But, you know, what do you think um, human resource teams role should be in, in helping define and, and shape organization future of work. I mean, we're talking about obviously on, on the reskilling side of it, but it goes deeper than that. 
Mm -hmm. Well, I've never considered myself a futurist, but I think I'm going to claim that title <laughs> because when I started in what was called personnel decades ago, I really chose that role because I felt like it was the position in the organization that had the most opportunity for influence and impact. And decades later, I was right, but I'm more right than ever now. I think human resources people are uniquely positioned in the organization to really make an impact both in the lives of the people that they lead and serve, but certainly in their organizations because business success is now more dependent than ever on the people in your organization, the people you're able to attract, the people you're able to retain, the people you're able to develop. And that's human resources sweet spot. So they're going to be able to make a real difference by stepping into that challenge. Absolutely. We have a we have an expression um, that, that we use um, here at Meta uh, when we're talking about, you know, future of work conversation, employee experience. And that is happy people equals happy customer equals happy business. And you really have to think about your people getting that right before you can even, you know, start to, to and from that, you know, incredible, impactful business results um, will, will come through. Um, I'm going to jump into an audience question. They're coming through thick and fast, Jennifer, loving what you're saying here. Um, so uh, from Gihan, um, how do we, can, and apologies if I've said your name incorrectly, um, how do we continue moving the needle when it comes to remote work? Wow, that's a good question. And I think that's G. She goes by G. Yeah, sorry, G. <laughs> um, so how do we continue moving the needle in terms of remote work? I think we have to understand how to do it well. Uh, I recently listened to a podcast, Adam Grant's uh, Work Life with Adam Grant podcast, where he talked with someone about a study that's been done on remote work and the fact that they've come up with it's actually more productive for people to be assigned days for everyone to come in the office. So that might be Tuesday and Thursday or Monday, Wednesday, Friday or Monday through Thursday. But by having everyone in the office, it helps for people to get the opportunity to build relationships, connect, have that innovation and also for people to understand what's expected and when it's required. So I think that's an example of what is the research telling us in terms of remote work? That's probably going to change. If you think back a year ago, we were all saying, I don't know that I ever did, but a lot of people were saying the office is dead. No one's going to work in an office ever again. Well, I look today, Abby, you look to be in an office, in a corporate office, right? <laughs> So we were wrong. There are people coming back to the office and that's going to change. I read an article this week that said, you know, remote work is dead. So again, as a leader, the future of work is today, tomorrow, next week, and constantly evolving, ever changing. You're going to have to be doing your own research with your own workforce. You're going to have to understand what the preferences are and also what your business requirements are. If you're required to be in the office, there should be a reason for that. And you should be able to communicate that. If you're allowing people or certain people to be able to work from home, you need to be able to explain what the criteria is for who's able to do that. So as leaders, we've got to be constantly looking at what's new, what's next, what are our people feeling today, because that's going to change. Absolutely. And it's interesting you sort of like say about the, you know, if you, if, you know, potentially having, you know, one's designated um, day and, you know, I, I've read a lot about it, about, you know, it should be down to individual teams and actually working out what's what's right for for, for them as, as much as anything and not just having a, a top down right it's going to be on this day you know actually sort of like really thinking about well why are we coming into into the office and if we're then going to have um you know like what's that connection point to it that you you won't get um from a from a, a virtual um setting um marlo i'm just going to come back to your question because bang has just asked a question which i think is a really good follow on to the conversation that, that we are having, which is um, hybrid working is strongly encouraged, but how can we better manage and upskill employees during this time? Well, you have a lot of opportunity with technology. There are certainly a lot of AI tools out there today that can help you understand the skills of your existing workforce that pulls from profiles that they may have online, from the job description that they have compared to thousands of job descriptions. So there are a lot of companies that are doing some really cool things in terms of AI for, I assume, larger organizations that are able to employ that product in their organization. So that might be an opportunity, but also there's the self-identification of skills. Accenture, for 
example, is a, you know, a large global organization who has gone all in on their people strategy. And not only do they use AI to help develop, to identify the skills that people have, they allow the employee to be able to go into their profile and either delete skills that they don't believe that they have that are good enough or to add skills that they've developed. So whether people are working in the office or uh, remotely, it's an opportunity for us to use technology and self-assessments to be able to identify the skills as a starting place. You know, you can always refine as you go, but getting a good database of the skills and an inventory of what individuals have is really critical. So just start. If you don't, if you don't have 10,000 people in your company and you can't go out and employ eightfold AI to do that, then go ask people, what skills do you have? Look at their LinkedIn profiles. What skills have they identified? It's a start. Absolutely. And it's not a one and done. Right. As you say, it needs to, you know, have that um, uh, continual, um, you know, uh, uh, conversation uh, and, you know, as, as um, folks lean into personal development, professional development, et cetera, your new skills will always start to come through. Um, Marlo, I am coming to your question now. Right. So um, what do you think will be a high demand job five years from now? You know, I'm going to go back to where I started decades ago. I'm going to say human resources, the people team, whatever it's called in your organization. Again, people are going to be, we've long said people are our most important asset, but the reality is the innovation, the adaptability, the change, even with more technology in the workplace will come from the people that you're able to attract and retain in your organization. And again, that starts with a good people team. So I'm going to say the people team. Certainly, we need people with, you know, STEM skills. We need people who can do the things that the organization needs to do to remain competitive. But if we don't get them, if we don't keep them, and if we don't develop them, then we won't be able to do the initiatives that we have. And uh, Jorge, I'm going to come back to your question because, Jennifer, I think it's really important to just lean into to that point, which is around next generation of, of leaders. You know, how can, how can organizations best prepare the next generation of talent and future leaders and by leaders we we could actually also mean people managers um you know particularly as they enter um the workforce absolutely i think it's interesting ddi does an annual global leadership forecast and this year the number one challenge that global leaders identified going forward into the future of work was the development of the next generation of leaders because again they're looking at well we have a lot of change ahead of us a lot of unknowns we have a lot of new people younger workers coming into the workplace we have hybrid work we have remote work we need leaders who have both the people skills and the business skills to be able to move our organization forward. So it's critical first that you prioritize that development and identification of your next generation of leaders. Again, a lot of times I'm talking with business leaders and they're talking about the importance of developing high potential employees. And when I ask how they go about developing, you know, actually identifying who the high potentials are in their organization, they don't have a system for it. It's, well, this person, you know, this manager recommended this person or this person was aggressive and asked for it. And those are certainly important ways to identify high potential but back to who are the people that are demonstrating the skills that you need? Who are the people that are actively growing in development? Who do have some natural leadership talent? You need a system for identifying those people. And then you need to provide learning and development for them that goes beyond a team that comes together and attends a training class once a year. That could be curated learning from sources all over the web. That could be classes that, you know, again, talking about Accenture, recently I spoke with their CHRO and she mentioned, you know, we're in the past they would bring people into the corporate headquarters from all over the world to attend a class. They've learned now that they have contracted with a professor at MIT to teach some of the classes that they're wanting their leaders to learn. And everyone from all over the world can attend that remotely. So again, the technology that's available to us, the opportunity to grow and develop people is, is fantastic. It's better than it ever has been. So the real challenge for developing future leaders is what is our process? who's going to be in the program, and it could be very broad. Maybe people self-select and, and they eventually are identified for further growth, but there's so much opportunity to grow your leaders today out there than there ever has been before. And so to step onto that, that challenge and make it happen is really important. 
Yeah, I think it's really interesting on the on the self selects, but it, it's also down to the fact that everyone learns in a in a different way and, and your preferences is, you know can be different and one of the you've mentioned Accenture a, a couple of times what one of the things that I really have um have loved watching watching them uh lean into is around their their VR um you know sort of like onboarding program um and I I know I can say that as you know they're using Oculus um uh to to, to do that but I think it's really you know it, it's a really good way of onboarding folks uh, and sort of like giving them that connected um experience uh, and you know onboarding of course is a is a part of um of L and D and and training on that side um I'm going to come to Jorge's question. Uh, do you think a degree will be needed in the future of work when it comes to hiring? Absolutely not. The degree itself, no. Maybe the learning that is associated with the degree, yes. There are certainly, I don't want my doctor to have not been to medical school and learned things that he or she needs to learn in order to heal me and make me better. So there's always going to be a path for you know learning and development for certain career paths and to develop certain skills. But do we need to crown them with a, a bachelor's or a graduate degree? Not necessarily. I think degrees are more and more not being shown on job descriptions, they're being taken away as a requirement, and rightfully so, because if you can't demonstrate that the physical degree actually is a requirement and why, then it shouldn't be there, because there's so many people out there that have the skills, again, that are potentially available to you if you remove some of the stringent requirements that we have just put on job descriptions and job postings for years with no real reason. That as much comes down to to, to training of um, uh, people managers putting in uh, requests into as much as it is on 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 talent and and, and recruitment teams as as well to to actually look at at the requirements of uh, of of the job and associated skills. I just I'm interested to kind of get your thoughts on like how that would how would that would work. Well, I think, again, you know, it, it has to be what is it about the degree that's required in the job? You know, is it the specific training that someone would get in a degree program? And if they can access that somewhere else, is it possible that you can bring those people in? Can you provide some assessments or certifications internally that you're able to assess people's skills so that they don't have degrees? So you're right. The people teams really have to do the legwork. When I see job postings out there today for an entry level human resources professional with five years of experience, a bachelor's degree and a SHRM <laughs> certification, I'm like, who read that? You know, because <laughs> that makes no sense. I think what you also have to do, and I had this very early on in my career, you know, maybe semi-relatable, where our VP of operations came to me. He was he was having a moment. He was having a little bit of hissy fit about something I'd asked him to do. And he threw out the gauntlet to me and he said, I want everyone that's hired in our manufacturing plant to have a high school degree. Now, again, this was years ago, and we did not require a high school degree, but he threw down in our organization of hundreds of hourly employees that he now wanted everyone to have a high school degree. So I could have argued with him. I could have thrown things at him, but instead I went, and it was the time again before technology was available, I pulled all of the personnel files of all of the hourly employees that we had, and I wrote down who had a degree and who didn't, and I went back into his office and I said, these are some of our best employees, our lead operators, our maintenance technicians, they don't have degrees. Are you telling me that you want me to not be able to hire people like them in the future? And he changed his mind because he was presented with real time information that said this is not necessary. So that's the work that HR has to do, both prove why it may or may not be necessary, but also show the data as to why it's required or not. I love that example. It's yay for doing that. <laughs> Um, uh, question coming in from Graham. Um, if we examine culture, it is very clear that different organizations have different cultures. If there's no generic office culture, would this represent a fundamental challenge? I think it's a challenge, but not the challenge that we've typically looked at in terms of culture and having people be culture fit or buy into the culture. The reality is, if you're in an organization, again, of 100 people or 1,000 people or 10,000 people, you in leadership could say our culture is this, but the reality is there are thousands of cultures throughout your organization. Each team has a culture because culture is a lot of times uh, coming from the leadership. Uh, the you know departments could have a culture, 
regions can have a culture. So culture, I think we need to evolve that thinking more to what are our true values of the organization and not just the ones that we stick on the wall and, you know, recite remotely, but what are the values that we have as an organization from our leadership and that we want our people to cling to? And then what is the purpose of our organization? The research today shows that people of all ages, not just the younger workforce, really want to connect with a purpose in their work. So whether you're making widgets or you're making you know, driverless cars or cancer saving equipment, you as leadership has to really define the purpose of the work that you do. And then the leadership needs to cascade down to the individual all the way at the entry level from the top down so that they can really cling to the work that I do matters. So I think it's not so much culture anymore. It's values and its purpose and it's really doing the communication and the training to help people connect with the values and the purpose so that they can say this is where I belong I work here because I believe in what we do and the work that I do matters and whether it's a good day or a bad day I'm still engaged because what we do matters I can't believe we've only got five minutes left and there's a lot of questions to get through. I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but I'm just going to do two more um, for you, Jennifer, before I um, uh, close uh, the session. So uh, next one's from uh, Dashika. Do you have any advice on changing the mindsets of more traditional employees who are not familiar with either latest technologies um, or um flexible working or remote working um, into the more futuristic working practices. It goes back to what data can you collect? How can you communicate to them what is happening? Uh, and what's required for the future. Some of that might be predicting out into the future, but it's similar to the example that I gave with the VP of operations who gave me that ridiculous directive. We've got to show people the data. If their jobs are going to be changing in the future that is going to maybe require the remote people to come into the office, what is the data, the reasoning behind that? And it can't be, or it won't be effective if it's just that our CEO believes everyone should be in the office. Good HR people, good leaders, good hiring managers, uh, you know, people, the leaders of the future are going to have to come with data. And they're also going to need to talk about things as far out in advance as possible. We saw a lot of this at the beginning of the pandemic. Employee engagement, according to Gallup, actually went up in the first three months of the pandemic. For, you know, it had been pretty steady for years, but to have it go up during a global crisis, when they dug deeper, a lot of it was around more frequent communication from leaders, you know, getting on that daily Zoom call saying, here's what we know today, here's what we don't know, here's what we're trying. So leaders were actually sharing more in real time what was happening and what they knew and what they didn't know. Engagement began to go down towards the end of 2020 because we probably all got bored with Zoom meetings, you know, the daily updates of what we knew. But I I think it really demonstrated that as leaders, we need to be talking to our people more and often. We need to be sharing what we're thinking. We need to be sharing why we're doing things, and we need to prepare them for their future of work with as much data as we can give them. Thank you for that. Final question, and it's one of mine. Um, how do you think that the metaverse is going to change work? Moderator privilege, the last question. I know. <laughs> I can do it. <laughs> I think, you know, I'm really intrigued with the metaverse. I think it does open up the opportunity for us to be able to not only communicate, because you can do that, you could have done that with an old school phone call, you know, before technology allowed us to be able to do that. But the more we can give people immersive experiences so that they can really feel the connection, I think that's helpful to be able to communicate in a variety of ways, whether it's video, whether it's text, whether it's, you know, group chats, et cetera. I think the metaverse opens up so many ways for us to really build relationships and connection and culture to, to grow and develop our organization cultures by having people participate in a more immersive way than they ever have before, regardless of where they're located, regardless of whether they're in the office or working from their bedroom at home. Wonderful. Jennifer, I could wish that we had an extra half hour, but we don't. Um, thank you so much uh, for being such a wonderful um, guest. Uh, and thank you to everyone joining us today for this live and for those of you watching it back on demand. Um, we really appreciate you uh, taking time out of your day to, to join us. Now, if you have enjoyed today's conversation, if you don't already, 
I would highly encourage you to follow Jennifer across all of her um, social media accounts, channels, um, but also to tune in to her newly, well, it's, I shouldn't say new because it is back again, um, weekly podcast, Impact Makers, which actually launched yesterday. Is that, that was right? Yesterday? It is. Yeah. Uh, a rebirth episode is out there for you. New episodes will be coming every week fantastic and that is about the future of work so go and check that out have a listen and i'm sure you will thoroughly enjoy it so thank you jennifer um and uh we will be back in september with another fantastic guest to talk about the future of work um, we are going to be talking to bridget hyacinth bridget is an international keynote speaker best-selling author and thought leader on leadership hr AI and digital transformation. The live is going to be on Thursday, the 15th of September. Mark your calendars, you won't want to miss it. And the team should be dropping the link to the next event into um, the comments now. So you can go and register your interest and get a notification um, in advance of that. Thank you again, Jennifer, for joining us. Thank you to everyone um, for taking the time to, uh, to watch this live or watch it back on demand. We appreciate you. See you next time. Bye.